Hey, so good to see all of you in church today. I know it's sunny, I know it's warm, but this is the best place to be on a Sunday morning. Hey, wasn't the worship incredible? The atmosphere of God is in this place. And just because we are going on to a different part of the service doesn't mean the atmosphere of God is leaving. God is speaking through his word. And let's pray really quickly, shall we? Lord Jesus, I pray that you speak through me this morning. Holy Spirit, would you make your words come alive? Your word says that your, your word is alive and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. So this morning as we listen, as we unpack your word, God, would it stir in, in us? Would it break through things in us? Would it speak to us? In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, as, as Pastor Tom said, we, we're continuing this um, book study, this series on the book of Ephesians, and today we are going to begin chapter 5. And if you are just tuning in to this series, if today is your first day, let me give you a really quick recap, like one of those recaps on Netflix. Not as entertaining, probably, but I'll try. The book of Ephesians is a letter, okay? It was written by the Apostle Paul to the ancient church in Ephesus, and the letter divides neatly into two parts. The first part we covered last year unveils the beauty of God's grace in creating a new unified humanity. In essence, it's, it's, it's communicating the gospel message. And in the second half, we find Paul pivoting to challenge the church, to challenge Christians on how to respond to this incredible message. And Paul provides vital instruction on living in unity within this new humanity as part of God's family. And he provides instruction and guidance that resonates just as powerfully with the church today as it did with the Ephesian church. So today we're going to continue to unpack Paul's um, teachings on how the body of Christ should function according to God's design. Last Sunday, Pastor Tom concluded chapter four in which Paul wrote about how the Christian life, being part of God's family, is a life of complete transformation. We heard how Paul called us, or calls us to step away from our old selves, our old ways, and to step into a new transformed self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And Paul reminds us that this transformation touches every aspect of our lives, our thoughts, our words, our actions, our relationships. And Paul urges us to speak truth, to work honestly, to build others up with our words, and to forgive as Christ has forgiven us. And now we, we turn the page today to chapter five, and Paul continues and deepens this theme of transformation. And as we dig into the verses today, we'll see how the principles laid out in chapter four and the previous chapters, they find their fullest expression in a life that reflects God's own character. So today, as Pastor Tom said, we're going to cover verses 1 to 7. I'm going to read through this passage. We're going to read through it all the way together. And then I'm going to walk us through verse by verse. And we'll unpack the scripture as it goes. All right? So if you've got your Bibles, you can turn to Ephesians 5, verse 1 to 7. I'm reading from the NIV translation. It'll be on the screen behind me as well. It says this. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. Walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to, the, to, to God. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Ooh. Let's cover the first section first, shall we? This passage divides uh, really nicely into two separate themes. We're gonna cover verses one to two first. Um, just to recap, it says, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. Walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And verse 1 is segmented here by a therefore. As Pastor Tom taught us the other week, any time that there is a therefore, we must ask what it is. Therefore, exactly. And the therefore in this verse is connecting the theme of love here to the previous chapter's teaching about putting off the old self and putting on the new self in Christ. At the end of the previous chapter, Paul talked about these ideas of forgiveness and compassion. And he continues these ideas here by instructing us to follow God's example and walk in love. And it seems quite straightforward, but I think there are a few things worth expanding on. 
First is this, that we are called to imitate. The word follow is also translated as imitate in other translations. We're called to be an imitator, a follower. The Amplified translation says this, copy him and follow his example. It makes it so clear. And to me, this speaks of a lifelong learning, of an attitude of which we shouldn't grow out of. And this idea is reinforced by how we are called to imitate. Paul instructs us to follow God's example, but how are we to do that? We are to do that as dearly loved children of God. Paul is urging the Ephesians and ultimately us to imitate God just as children imitate their parents. If you heard my message on Ephesians 4, you'll remember Paul used the analogy of infants to encourage us to grow up in our faith, right? But in contrast here, Paul is reminding us that although we are to be, become spiritually mature and grow, thus growing out of our spiritual infancy, we are and will always be children of God, because this pertains to our identity. We are sons and daughters of God. More than that, we are dearly loved sons and daughters of God. And as Christians, we've given up our old life and we've been adopted into God's family. As children of God, we are called to assume the posture that children have towards their parents, children have towards their Father in heaven. The word children comes from the Greek word technon, which the helps word studies describes this way. It'll be on the screen as well. It says, uh, anyone living in full dependence of the heavenly father, i.e. willing, uh, fully willing, relying upon the Lord in glad submission. This prompts God to transform them into his likeness. The word is also described as a child living in willing dependence, which illustrates how we must all live in utter dependence upon the Lord, moment by moment, drawing guidance, care, and nurture from our heavenly father. And finally, it's described this way. It emphasizes the childlike, not childish, and there's the distinction. Childlike attitude of the heart that willingly, gladly submits to the Father's plan. So Paul is saying here that we are called to follow God's example as his children, assuming a posture and attitude of dependence and submission. We're called to imitate. We are called to imitate like children. So what are we called to imitate? Well, we are called to imitate God's example. And what, what does that mean? Well, this is the example of love, particularly this idea of forgiving love that's outlined in the last verse of chapter four. Let, let me remind you what verse 32 says. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you, dot, dot, dot. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. God's example is his love for us. One of the commentaries on this verse says it this way, the knowledge of God's love for us is the first source of our love for him. 1 John 4, 19 says, we love because he first loved us. This unconditional, uh, uh, forgiving love is what we are called to imitate. So that's verse one. And verse two continues the theme of imitating the love of God. This time Paul instructs us to walk in the way of love to walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Well, what is the way of love? It's how Christ loved us, selfless and sacrificial. So if verse one teaches us that we are to imitate God's love, verse two teaches us the way we are to imitate God's love. In other words, we love because God loved us first and has adopted us into his family, and the way we are to love is by walking in the way of love. This means to follow in Jesus' footsteps. This means we are to follow the path that he has set before us by modeling our lives after him. The Amplified reads this way, and I think it makes it so clear. Walk continually in love, that is, value one another, practice empathy and compassion, unselfishly seeking the best for others, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us as an offering and sacrifice to God, slain for you so that it became a sweet fragrance. Christ's model for how to walk in love is sacrificial. It's not self-serving, it's not selfish, but selflessly seeking the best for others. Can you imagine if our entire city embody, embodied this model? Selflessly seeking the best for others. Our city would be completely transformed. But the reality is, the opposite is the example often displayed in the world, or by leaders, in government or business, or maybe even your workplace. 
The model of the world is a domineering model. How can I put myself first? How can I bring myself to the top of the pile? Jesus' model is a sacrificial model. This is the standard set for us as Christians. Just as Jesus did, you do. We are called to live out the highest form of love, sacrificial love. This should be our posture, to offer ourselves to those around us as a gift, as a sacrifice to God. And that's important to remember, to God. Others may want you to be a certain kind of gift or want different gifts from you or for you to love them in a certain kind of way or to be pleasing in the eyes of culture. But actually what Paul is saying here is that we are to love those around us and be a gift to them in a way that is pleasing to God. So Paul begins chapter five by looking back and reinforcing and expanding on the ideas he outlined in the previous chapter. However, as we continue on to verse three, we notice Paul switches topics quite drastically, doesn't he? He says this, but among you there must be not even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people, nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking which are out of place but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. It's quite jarring, isn't it? We go from reading about God's love and Christ's model of walking in sacrificial love, and then suddenly Paul's saying, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality. He starts talking about these serious vices and their significant consequences. Fun tangent for you. Um, Chapters and verses in the Bible are an interesting thing. As I mentioned before, the book of Ephesians was originally written as a letter, right? So Paul didn't actually write in chapters or verses into his letter. I don't know if you've ever written a letter, but it probably didn't have chapters or verses, right? In fact, none of the Bible was broken down into chapters or verses by the original writers. Chapters were only introduced in the 13th century and verses added a couple of centuries after to help readers navigate the text. Before that, ancient readers of the Bible would have navigated the text by following different ideas and themes that the writers used to drive home their messages. And this is what we're seeing here in chapter five, an intentional move. Paul's shift in focus may seem abrupt, but he's deliberately contrasting the Christian way of life with the prevailing pagan societal norms of the day of the audience that he was writing to. And let me give you some context on that. He was writing to the church in Ephesus, and the culture of the city of Ephesus stood in stark contrast to the culture of the kingdom of God. The city of Ephesus was home to one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the temple of Artemis, which was also home to the cult of Artemis. Surprise, surprise. And the culture, the cultural landscape of the city was dominated by this cult which not only tolerated sexual immorality, but celebrated it, okay? Sexual practices, including orgies, sacred prostitution, were often tied into religious worship. People believed that participating in ritual sex acts as part of their worship could appease the gods and thus bring fertility or virility to their various endeavors, whether that was business or farming or athletic contests or having children or you name it. And so sex was actually an integral part of many religious ceremonies. In the city of Ephesus, anything and everything was permissible. Sexual immorality wasn't just limited to the religious spaces, to worship or ceremonies. It was woven into the very fabric of Ephesian society. This was a a culture where purity was seen as naivete and restraint was weakness. And as we reflect on Ephesians, or on ancient Ephesus, sorry, We might be tempted to view such rampant sexual immorality as a relic of the past. But I think you don't have to look for long to see unsettling parallels within our own society. Because whilst we might not have temples dedicated to a fertility goddess, we do have many digital shrines to the sexual gratification that are accessible at the touch of a button. I want to talk this morning just for a few moments about the issue of pornography. See, the proliferation of pornography in our digital age is staggering. Recent studies show that 35% of all internet downloads are related to pornography. Research also shows that porn sites receive more regular traffic than Netflix, Netflix, 
Amazon, and X, formerly Twitter, combined. The porn industry's annual revenue exceeds $97 billion worldwide, surpassing combined revenues of top technology companies. According to Ofcom, an Ofcom report from September 2020, that was four years ago, approximately half of all UK adults watch porn. And if we're to model the UK after the trends in the US, that number significantly increased in the pandemic and stayed there. Even more alarming is the fact that the average age of first exposure to pornography is now just 11 years old. And this isn't an issue just for young boys, but also for young girls and also amongst men and women. Because the constant bombardment of sexual content is reshaping societal norms and it's reshaping individual expectations and behaviors towards sex and relationships. Simultaneously, the normalization of sex work has, be, has seen a significant rise, particularly through platforms like OnlyFans. During the COVID-19 pandemic, OnlyFans reported a 75% increase in new content creators, reflecting a broader acceptance of sex work as a viable form of income. And this shift is, a, is part of a larger trend where sex work is increasingly framed as empowerment or sex positivity. Just as in ancient Ephesus, where sexual practices were intertwined with religious and economic life, today's society increasingly views sex as a transactional commodity. And it's against this backdrop of pervasive sexual immorality, both in ancient Ephesus and as Christians, I think, in our modern world as well, Paul addresses the church. But amongst you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any impure kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. With the context that we now have, we can see that this, what Paul is saying, is a radical call to a new way of living, a way of living that stands in stark contrast to the surrounding culture. Paul's language here is precise and profound, setting a high standard for believers, for Christians, and emphasizing the distinctiveness of Christian life. It's gone rather quiet in here. I do find it interesting that Paul talks about these two issues, sexual immorality and impurity. And then he talks about greed in the same breath. Why does he do that? Well, he's, it, he does it because he's addressing the, the, the sins, the issues of action and of attitude. The desire for instant gratification, coveting what is not yours, desiring more than you need. Paul is saying this isn't an attitude that followers of Jesus should have, and attitudes ultimately lead to actions. Material greed and lust are two things taken quite lightly in the world today, but explicitly condemned by Paul. Attitudes lead to actions. In fact, Paul is so concerned about these issues that he says that there should not even be a hint, or in other translations, don't even mention it amongst yourself. And when you read that, you might ask yourself, well, hasn't Paul just contradicted himself here because he's talking about it himself? No. Paul is, what Paul is saying here is that this is not something that you should be known for. See, Ephesus was known for sexual immorality. For them, sexual immorality was an immorality. It was talked about freely. It was normalized. There was more than a hint amongst them because they were known for it. It was part of their identity. And we read throughout God's word that as Christians, our identity should be found in Christ. Our identity should be found in Jesus. And this is contrary to the message conveyed in our culture that encourages people to make their identity all about their financial success, or about their achievements, or possessions, or about their sexuality. Paul is saying to the church here, don't do it. Even more than that, don't make it your identity. There shouldn't be a hint amongst the church. This is not something the church should be known for. He continues, he says, nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Paul separates the sins, the issues, in verse three from those in verse four to emphasize the severity and seriousness of sexual immorality, impurity, and greed. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18, Paul says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that, the, that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, 
whom you received from God. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Paul is outlining the severity of sexual sin, saying that all other sins are, are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually are inside the body. And he backs that up with urgent language of fleeing from sexual immorality. In Colossians 3, verse 5, it says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. Again, we see dramatic language of putting to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. That choice of language is intentional. The separation, though, doesn't lessen the seriousness of what he writes about in verse 4. It merely puts emphasis on verse 3. His separation also helps us to distinguish two types of sin here. And when I say the word sin, if you're newer um, to church, if you're early in your journey of being a Christian, sin is a biblical word that describes falling short of God's best for us. I think in, in today's society, sin can, people don't like that word. What I'm talking about here is falling short of God's best for us. So, Paul's separation helps us to distinguish the two types of sin here. Number one, sins of attitude and action, and two, sins of communication. In verse four, Paul is addressing sins of communication. And as I said before, sexual immorality, impurity, and greed were pervasive in Ephesian society, not just in action and attitude, but also in conversation and communication too. We've always said as a church here at Proclaimers, we want to be a church where men can be men and women can feel safe. And the, true is the, and the same is true the other way around. We want to be a community that lives and acts in contradiction to what the world might accept. We are not to be people who make misogynistic comments or sexist remarks or use degrading language. That is not who we are. Paul emphasizes that our speech should reflect our new identity in Christ. The way we talk matters. Our words have power, my friends. And as followers of Jesus, we are called to use that power for good, to build each other up, not for degradation, or, uh, and, and not to use our words for degradation or foolishness. Paul makes it clear that impure language is contradictory to how we should live as Christians. And instead, he offers up an alternative, thanksgiving. Now, the Greek word here used for thanksgiving is, is the word eucharista, eucharistia, something like that. It's where we get our word for Eucharist or communion. It's the communion meal. This is a, a powerful reminder of Christ's sacrifice for us. When we receive and we partake in communion, we remember what Christ did for us. By, it's by his atoning work on the cross, his death and resurrection, that we have been made righteous with Christ. It's by Christ's atoning work that we have freedom in this new life, that we can step into this new creation, that we can live as part of God's family in this new kind of freedom. So instead of engaging in speech that tears down or degrades, we should speak words of gratitude and praise at every opportunity so as to remind ourselves of the goodness of Christ. The attitude of thanksgiving keeps our focus on God's goodness and reminds us of our identity in Jesus. Let's continue to verse five. It says, for of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. The Apostle Paul does not mince his words, that's for sure. But this is a serious and sobering statement. You see, there is an inheritance for the saints, for Christians, for followers of Jesus, for those who are part of God's family. And this inheritance is accessed through Jesus Christ, as outlined in the first chapter of Ephesians. In chapter 1, verse 11, in him we have obtained an inheritance. Also in 1 Peter 1, 3 to 4, this explains it really well, what Paul means by an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. It says this, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Our inheritance is the gift of salvation, of eternal life with God in heaven. This is the inheritance for all saints, for all Christians, for all believers. But there is a disqualifier, as we've read. So, Sam, 
what are you saying? Are you saying that if anyone who's ever committed sexual sin, does that mean that they're disqualified? No. God is not waiting for you to slip up so he can cut you off. There is grace for all, and God calls us into repentance of our sin so that we can live in freedom through Jesus. And I think it's important to differentiate here between those who have sinned and fallen into temptation and are repentant and those who sin without repentance to the point where it becomes their identity. A little English lesson for us here today. Don't worry, I stole this from a, a theologian, a doctor of theology, so you can know it's correct. The descriptors used here are adjectives used as nouns, which are also called substantive adjectives. I learned that for the first time. And some of the descriptors are actually nouns. What this means is that Paul is not talking about those who struggle with sexual immorality or impurity or greed or have acted on temptation in these areas. Paul is talking about people who are so identified by their sin that they are described by it. People who, are unab- who unashamedly embody a lifestyle of persistent and unrepentant sin. That's who Paul is talking about. But I think regardless, this is an incredibly hard message to digest in our current cultural climate. A climate that bulks at the mention of a religious word like sin. I I think the boundaries of morality have shifted in wider culture. I think today, morality is more likely to be interpreted as, you can do whatever you want as long as it doesn't hurt someone else, mostly. In fact, I don't think I'd be too wrong in suggesting that for many people today, one of the greatest sins might be described as not being true to yourself and what you want. And what I mean by that is not being or doing or pursuing whatever it is that you want that makes you happy, disregarding the rules or opinions or expectations imposed by others. Or in the words of the great Scandinavian intellect, Princess Elsa, no wrong, no right, no rules for me, I'm free. (laughs) I can't take credit for that. I stole that from one of my favorite authors. But, But this is what it means to live freely in today's day and age, doesn't it? Making it very difficult for those heavily influenced by culture to comprehend how denying yourself and your desires can lead to freedom. How is that freedom in today's culture? And whilst Paul instructs us not to judge those outside of the church, In 1 Corinthians 5, 12, he immediately follows that up by encouraging Christians within the church to keep each other accountable. And this is where friction occurs because Christianity and the culture that we live in have very different starting points and understandings of what it means to live freely. And whilst we are called to live in or to be in the world but not of the world, it still requires us to exist in an environment that has the potential to influence us. Paul presents the Christian understanding of freedom in Galatians 5, 13 to 14. He says this, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. We heard that earlier, didn't we? For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. True freedom, according to Paul, is not the ability to indulge your every desire, but the power to love and serve as others as Christ loved us. If freedom in the world is self-gratification and pursuing and indulging the desires of your flesh, to use Paul's language, freedom in Christ is to live with childlike dependence and submission to the Father's plan, walking in the way of love. All that to say, for those who are currently struggling with any kind of sexual sin or have anyone or know anyone, a loved one who is, let me encourage you this morning, there is freedom for you. The question is, how how do we access this freedom that comes with this new identity in Christ that I've talked about? How do we shake off the old and step into the new? Well, Paul's plea in 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 18 is clear. Flee from sexual immorality. We are called to run away from this kind of sin, not to flirt with it or see how close we can get to it without falling. We're to flee from it. And how do we do that? Well, in his book, Live No Lies, John Mark Comer talks about the pull of the disordered desires of the flesh. He says that so often Christians fail in their attempt to free themselves from sin and give in to the acts of the flesh as described in uh, Galatians 5, 19 to 21. We'll read that in a moment. They so often fail in their attempts to free themselves because they rely on willpower alone. 
And willpower alone, is, it's not a bad thing, but it is self-reliant and often insufficient. Even at its strongest, it's often no match for deeply ingrained sinful behaviors or patterns. He says this, this is a direct quote from his book. Um, Willpower versus a second cookie, that's one thing. But willpower versus triggered trauma, willpower versus addiction, willpower versus a father wound, it doesn't stand a chance. It goes on to talk about the neurological evidence that backs this up, but we don't have time for that, nor do I have the expertise. Go and ask Dr. Phil. But John Mark Homer goes on to suggest that if you're trying to use willpower alone against your self-defeating behavior that's rooted in trauma or past pain or addiction, or you feel like you're failing, don't beat yourself up. Change your strategy. Willpower is not the answer to your problem. You need something stronger. To win, you need, the access, you need access to a power that is beyond your ability. And that power is the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's read further in Galatians 5, 16 onwards. It says, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the Spirit desires what is contrary to the, sorry, the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not able to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of flesh, which we talked about earlier, are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And so John Mark Homer highlights that Paul gives us three practical applications from this passage to help us access this power. Number one, walk in the Spirit. Number two, be led by the Spirit. And number three, live by the Spirit and keep in step with the Spirit. This is about relying on the power of God rather than on our own strength. It's about cultivating a deep moment by moment dependence on the Holy Spirit to transform us from the inside out. Freedom is found when we surrender to God. So can I encourage you, when temptation comes knocking, call on the power of the Holy Spirit. Lean on his strength and not your willpower. Next week, Pastor Tom's going to cover the following verses in Ephesians 5, which also provide some vital application about bringing your struggles into the light. And I would encourage you to do, make every effort to be there next week. But I also want to encourage you now that if this is something that you are struggling with, please talk to someone that you trust, someone that you feel safe with opening up about all of this. Don't suffer in silence. Reach out. Bring it into the light. Darkness cannot exist in the light. Okay, last last verses. Verse six to seven. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Paul is cautioning us here not to be swayed by cultural arguments that try to justify or normalize sinful behavior. We are called to be discerning, to test everything against the truth of God's word. And finally, we are instructed not to be partners with those who persist in disobedience. Now, this doesn't mean that we are to isolate ourselves from the world. The response to being a cult is not to become a cult, guys. We're not to isolate ourselves from the world, but it does mean that we should remain vigilant. Jesus prayed in John um, 17, verse 15. My prayer is is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. We are called to be in the world, but not of the world. To engage with our culture whilst maintaining our distinct identity as followers of Christ. We are called to imitate God's love, to walk in purity, to use our words for good, to resist the pull of our culture's empty promises. It's a high calling, but remember, we're not left to do this on our own. We have the power of the Holy Spirit working within us, transforming us day by day into the image of Christ. And the image of Christ is what the world needs. 
The love of Christ is what the world needs. People are looking for salvation in all sorts of places, in all sorts of wrong places. Secularism, our culture today in the world will not bring the fulfillment that people are searching for. Friends, the church is not called to conform to that, but to stand out, to be set apart, to display God's love and grace and goodness with what we say, with what we do, and with how we act. So I want to challenge you this morning to rise to the challenge. Just as the Ephesian church stood out in a culture so opposite to that of the kingdom of God, let us hear proclaimers in Norwich and in Ipswich and beyond be ambassadors of Christ in every sphere, in every space, public or private, in every conversation, in every moment, in every relationship, in everything that we do to be ambassadors of Christ. Would you stand with me? I know this isn't the easiest topic to cover on a Sunday morning. (laughs) But God has called us into something significant. God has called us to be ambassadors of Christ. Wherever we walk, in your workplace, amongst your friends, in your school, in your family, as parents, as children, as friends, as employees, as bosses, as business owners, whatever sphere you walk in, you're called to be an ambassador of Christ, to walk in love, to embody the sacrificial model that Christ gave us. This is what we are called to. And if those stats are to be believed, there are people probably in this very room who are struggling, as Pastor Tom mentioned earlier, with strongholds. Perhaps there are those of you in this room who are struggling with things that are holding you back from freedom in life with Christ things that are holding you back from being all that God has called you to be. I don't know what song you guys have got lined up, but can we sing um, Speak Jesus? As we worship, would you call on the name of Jesus? If that's something that you're struggling with in this moment, call on him. It's not my eloquence or my preparation that transforms lives. Jesus it's not it's not your leaders in church or your friends or or whoever you met on the door that transforms lives it's Jesus the power in the name that is Jesus can transform every situation there is power in the name of Jesus maybe wherever you are in this moment would you close your eyes would you reach out Would you lean on him? Would you call on him to bring transformation into your heart, to your mind, to all of who you are?